everybody. Welcome to today's Novage webinar, What's New in RHEL Clone 5? In this session, the I2 team will explain the fundamentals of parametric modeling in RHEL Clone 5. They will also explain how to use the latest features of this new release. At the end of this presentation, you will be able to create your own architectural elements from, a simple rail, from simple railings to buildings or entire cities in a quick and easy to understand way. Today's webinar presenter, Paul Roberts, joined the i2 software team in 2013 and is an experienced 3D environment artist and educator who has been working with 3ds Max for nearly 30, 20 years and as a 3D designer and lecturer for the games, product design, and visualization industries. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Novedge and what we do. Novedge is changing the way designers purchase 3D software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice, and faster service. So check us out at Novedge.com. And, oops, wrong slides. Paul, I'm going to share your screen now. Sure. Take it away. Can you see me? We can see you. You're um, frozen because there's a little <laughs> okay. bit of a lag, but we can definitely okay. see you. Okay. Well, you won't see. It. Hopefully, you won't see me for long, so it's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so we, we're here to introduce Rail Clone Five, but more than that, this is also a general introduction to Rail Clone. We find with any um, major release going over just the new features doesn't make a lot of sense unless you have a grounding in rail clone to start with so um, we're going to spend the first third maybe just going over how to get up and running quickly with rail clone um, how to use presets how to build your own styles based on presets and so forth and then we're going to pepper it throughout with rail clone five treats <laughs> um, we're going to do this scene that was in the background there, uh, use this as the basis for the presentation. So this uses a lot of the features of Rail Clone 5, but also just Rail Clone generally, as well as a little bit of Forest Pack, because we obviously can't not talk about Forest Pack. Uh, so we're going to go over that now, and we're going to start with the very basics of what you would do the first time you downloaded and installed Rail Clone, which is generally to start looking at using the presets. Um, so in this scene, there are a couple of presets that we used, which is the balconies around the building and the railings in the foreground, which are actually kind of dark here, but they are there. Um, and so I just want to show you how we would create those from nothing. So first of all, there's you do need a spline to drive the preset. So I'm just using 3ds Max's standard spline tools to draw the path that I'd want this railing to follow. And I'm going to draw one on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the camera in the foreground to start with. You can see there's nothing fancy here. This is just using the skills that you would already know from 3ds Max. Once you've done that, you create a rail clone object by just dragging out the gizmo into the viewport and then go to the modify panel and open up the style, uh, sorry, the library browser. So just going to spend a little bit of time flicking through these various presets. There are quite a few hundred of them um, in various different categories, including fences, facades, cladding, groceries that you saw there a minute ago, various types of roofing, scaffolding, and, and so forth. And we have plans to both improve what's already there and to increase the number of presets included in this library in the future. So watch this space. Um, what we're going to do though now, once I've finished fiddling around, flicking through these, is just to pick one of the railings, the iron handrail top here for the foreground. So you just select it and you can pick the renderer that you want, or you can just leave it an automatic selector and it will detect the renderer for you and click import selected. It shows you a little preview of what you've got. And then all you need to do is to go to the base objects rollout and here's where you'll find the path that you need or the way you pick the path that you just select created so there we go we just pick the path and we've got an instant um, railing and of course this is parametric so if i adjust the path the railing updates automatically too and of course they don't have to be straight you can create curved railings just by changing the vertex type not that you want a railing like that but it's easy to do 
So that's that one. And just to show this process again, we'll do the second railing, the one around the building. So exactly the same. I already have a path up there for those railings. So I'd create a rail clone object just by drawing one in the scene, coming up to the modify panel, to the library browser, pick yourself a railing. In this case, I'm going to go for one of these glass hand railings. It's a bit more in keeping with the building. And then just come to the base objects rollout and pick the spline. That's all there is to it. Now, here I'm getting an error message. It said, hey, there's too many faces here. And this gives me a good excuse to mention the display mode. So at the moment, it's set to mesh, which isn't a good idea generally if you've got lots of polygons. But there's a quick mesh mode, which is basically enables viewport instancing. And in that mode, you're able to get a much clearer idea of the final geometry without overly taxing the viewport and slowing down your frame rates. Here's another one. Uh, Rail Clone also has a number of different curb presets, and Rail Clone is great for doing curbs and things like that, whether it's from the presets or from geometry that you've modeled yourself or maybe used from mega scans um, or somewhere like that. But it's very easy to do because it's basically bending stuff around splines. So in here, we'll just pick a curb from the library, and once again, just pick the base spline. Now, each one of these uh, pavements has a spline that runs around the perimeter of it, which I'm using here, and you'll see that we can use this for multiple things in this scene. So in the end, I'll have quite a lot of things driven by those that one spline. As you can see, this preset has a number of parameters that you can play with. So here I'm adjusting the gap between the um, curbs. Um, you can also change the width of the curbs a little bit if you want, or length, I probably should say. And we can change the offset, because at the moment they're slightly overlapping those pavement areas. So we can change the Y offset, maybe minus 20 centimeters, a bit too far. Let's knock it back a bit, minus 10 centimeters, just to push it out more into the road. Yeah. Go back to our camera view, we can see those elements in place. Well, my head's obscuring some of them, but you, can, you get the idea. So presets, as you can see, are very, very easy, but they'll only get you so far. At some point, your job's going to require some sort of geometry that isn't, there isn't a preset for, or you're going to want to adapt what's there. So in the next section, and this is the, normally the next way that people learn Rail Clone, is to take those presets, deconstruct them, adapt them, and then ultimately swap in your own geometry. So I'm going to show those three stages. So I'm going to do the ground floor of the building this time, and I am going to start again with a preset. So I'm going to just isolate the building so we can just see it. And you can see there's a spline around the ground floor there. I'm going to add a Rail Clone object, just drag it into the scene and then come down and open the library browser once again. Again, we're starting from uh, a pre-built preset. So I'm going to go to the curtain wall settings. I'm just going to pick one of these curtain wall settings that looks like it will do the job. Now I'm going to assign it to the spline from the base objects rollout. You'll start seeing a pattern forming here. And OK, it's there, but clearly it's too short. So in this particular situation, there isn't a parameter to control the height. So how do we adjust it? Well, in this case, we can go into the style editor and we can start to extract and adjust the geometry itself. But in order to do that, we need to understand what's going on. So these things here are called base objects. This is geometry that we've imported into the style editor and the splines. On the right hand side here, we've got the generator, which is like the brain of Rail Clone. It tells it how to build this style. And in the middle, we've got operators. And operators are basically ways of processing the geometry, could be transforming it, could be combining it, creating patterns and sequences and so forth. If I click on the segments, you'll see they say embedded on them. And that means the geometry is saved into the style itself. So how do you get it out to edit it? We can do that by going to the segments, drop down menu and clicking extract all. And when you do that, the geometry will be taken out of the rail clone object and dropped back into the scene where you can find it to edit. So here we can see the uh, geometry this style's built on. It's very simple, and that's the beautiful thing about rail clones. You can create complex objects from basic geometry. And um, it's got a live link. So if I drop an edit poly modifier on top of this, I can very easily just edit it, and you'll see the final style updates live. So I'm just changing the height a little bit, and you can see the rail clone object updates at the same time. I can move this um, sort of division around, same with the bottom one, and just make it fit my particular building. And you can see there's also a bit of a gap there, so I'll just adjust the pivots just to bring that back in under the floor plate. So the nice thing is, like I say, that it's all live, uh, all connected to these 
final segments. And once you've done with them, you can, of course, just delete them if you want to, and they'll be dumped back into the rail clone objects until you need them, and then you can extract them again later. So that's all well and good, but what if you want um, a different style that's not based on that geometry? That's where you can use this as a kind of springboard for your own geometry. So what we can do is to try and deconstruct this style. And a good way of doing this is just to go through the nodes, as I'm doing here, and just toggle on and off the nodes and see how the style changes. It'll give you a good idea of how this style is built. So I can see here, for example, I've got default segments, which fill basically all the way along the spline. I've got um, these segments here, which are corners. So these are corners and I've got evenly spaced segments in the middle. So I'll change the corner segment just by picking a new piece of geometry from the scene. You can see it's dropped it into the corner there. I could do the same thing for these evenly segments, these regularly spaced segments. I'll just choose new geometry. And then I want to fill in between those by changing this last one here, which is called the default geometry, default input geometry. And that fills in between the evenly corner segments. OK, and it scales it. This is the generator I've just selected. And as I mentioned, this is the brain or the rule set of rail clone. So just quickly, what I'm doing here is I'm changing the spacing between the evenly spaced pieces of geometry there. And that gives me a kind of final style that's passable for this particular project. And you can see, hopefully, how quickly and easily you can take an existing preset and just swap out your geometry. OK, but what if you want to create something completely from scratch? Well, hopefully by now you would start to get an idea of how you would do that. So we're going to create the next five floors or six floors from scratch. And it works in much the same way. So here's my building again, and I've got a spline that runs around the outside of each floor plate. So I've done that already, but it's basically creating a path for each floor. And that's how each floor can be a different shape. I've also got behind my head several types of uh, geometry here. So I've got five different types of default segment and I've got some corners and evenly segments too. So what I'm going to do is use those uh, to build a new style. But rather than do it on the final spline, which is quite large and can be complicated, I prefer to use a simplified spline like you see here, which is just basically a sort of Z shape, which gives me an internal and an external corner. Um, which will give me most conditions that I need in order to check that this style is working. I'll add a generator like we just saw and a spline and connect them up. And now I need to tell Railclone to use that new spline. So I just pick it from the scene like so. I need uh, to start bringing in the geometry. So I'm just going to add a segment node. And that's how you bring geometry into Railclone and start plugging it into this generator, into this rule set. And you can see here, I'm basically saying, hey, put that segment I just picked at the start and at the end of that spline by plugging it into the start and the end input. You've got various controls over how you align that geometry to the spline, which you can see I'm controlling here. So one for each axis, either top, bottom, left, right, or automatic. Um, generally, in order to make things jigsaw together correctly, I tend to set Z and Y to pivot, assuming you've set the pivots correctly, but leave X on an automatic because um, generally that does the best job. I'm going to bring in the other pieces of geometry. So I'm going to bring in another piece of geometry and plug that into the evenly input. So that is in the evenly input, but those evenly settings are very close together. So I'm coming into the rules for the evenly input, and each one of those inputs has a little section of the rules that you can use to change it. And I'll just increase the size a little bit. So you can see that distance parameter just changes the spacing of the evenly segments along the spline. You've got a few other modes. You've got adaptive, which will basically uh, make sure they're evenly spaced along the spline, so there's no smaller or, or larger ones. And you've got a count mode, which forces a certain number of segments along the spline, irrespective of how long it is. I'm going to stick with distance for now. So the longer the spline, the more evenly segments you'll get. And I'm also going to wire the same or wire a segment to the corner input. And you can see there's something a bit squiffy going on there. It's a little bit deformed. And that's because by default, uh, Rail clone is going to try and bend that piece of geometry around the corner, which you can see is not correct in this case. So what I want to do is to come to the rules again, and I'm going to say, hey, don't bend that corner. Instead, I want you to bevel it. So I'll just turn on bevel corner, and it slices it and bevels it around the corner instead. 
So now I've got evenly segments set up, start and an end and a corner. What I want to do is to start to fill in between those. And I do that by plugging something into the default input. So I mentioned before that every input has a little section in its rules that relates to how it's distributed. And here I have a problem because it's being sliced when it hits the evenly sections. So here um, you've got some settings to control the way that those default geometries are placed along the spline. So you can, for example, scale it here. As you can see, I scale one whole piece along the spline. I can do an adaptive mode, which basically uses whole segments and just scales them ever so slightly to make sure there's only ever whole segments in place. And you can also use a count mode, which prescribes the number exactly, irrespective of how long that spline section is. Note that I've removed evenly segments to illustrate this. I'm going to keep it on adaptive. I'm going to plug my evenly back in. There we go. So that's pretty straightforward, pretty much like the um, preset that we looked at earlier. And I can now assign this to the final geometry, the uh, final spline, sorry. So this is OK, but it's not very interesting because it's just a single default segment. What if we want to add a bit of randomization to that? What I'll do is clone the segment. I'm going to pick some new geometry from the scene. I'm going to pick three variations. If you want to randomize between those, you use what's called a modifier. So I'll just wire these segments through the modifier and then the modifier into the generator. And now you can see there's some randomization, those default segments. And that's really what modifiers do. They, like I say, they sequence, they randomize, they transform existing geometry. I'll just copy a couple more bits in. I've got a couple of bits with balconies on them just behind my head. And I'm just going to bring those in to illustrate sequence nodes, pattern creating nodes. So what I can do with that is I can create a pattern, which is balcony and then a randomized segment, balcony randomized segment across the x-axis of that spline. It's very easy to build these styles up quite quickly. Maybe instead of just a single uh, balcony, I'll randomize between two different balconies, but still alternate through the sequence node. And there we go. So now I've got some randomized balconies and a sequence set up just streaming through these nodes. You can see a little bit of an issue here because um, when segments, let me just pause the video for a second to explain this, when segments um, are on a corner, it puts the full width of the segment on each side of the corner. So on the corners which have a 90 degree bend on them, that's fine, that makes sense. But there are also some corners on the splines here which are just continuous. And what you end up with is a double width, you can see it here, a double width piece of geometry. So what I want to do is put a half width segment on those ones. And I can do that using this node here, which is called conditional node. And it basically lets me change the geometry based on various attributes of the base spline. In this case, I'm going to use the vertex angle. So I'm going to pick in a half sized piece of geometry and I'm going to use that on the vertices, which are above a certain angle threshold. So I'll turn on angle as the test. I'll change it to 95 degrees, for example. And what I'll end up with now is um, the half size segment on the straight sections and the full size segment on the 90 degree curves. And it's just a way of explaining what the conditional operator does really. You've also got a selector node as a type of modifier. And this is basically like a switch that lets you choose between multiple geometry inputs based on an index. So I can just switch this index here, you see, and it lets me choose between the various different inputs. It has various other modes too. Um, we'll just look at one now, which is material ID. So this lets you use the baseline to precisely place which geometry you want. So for example, maybe I want balconies on the front here. I just change the material ID and drive the geometry using material IDs. It makes it a very flexible way of laying out your buildings using very easy to use standard Max tools. And there we have uh, a final style built um, completely from scratch. I hope it made some sort of sense. Uh, this was using the linear generator, which is generally the first one that people learn. And then once they've done that, you'll usually step up to the two dimensional generator, um, the 2D generator, which gives you an X and a Y axis to deal with. It's not that much different from the linear generator, but it does cause a bit of confusion when people start out. So one way of thinking about it is that it's a stack of linear generators, one on top of the other, but we'll use the same geometry to build a building style using the 2D generator that can be built on uh, a single footprint on the ground as opposed to uh, a spline for each individual floor. 
So let's have a look at that. So we're going to move away from this building. I'm just going to do this one in the background here, which you can see is the same kind of geometry. So the, the first thing to know about the two-dimensional generator, the A2S generator, is that it builds its 2D array on the X and the Y axis. So where you might be tempted to build your pieces upright like that, like a building would stand, actually you need to lay them down flat on the XY plane and then reset the X form. And then they'll work properly inside of rail clone. Then we carry on as normal. So we create a rail clone style. You'd open the style editor. And this time you'd want the two dimensional array, which is a little bit more intimidating looking. It's just, but it's just got a lot more inputs. There's nothing much more to it. We're going to wire an X spline to determine the footprint. I'm going to take a single spline to start with again, trying to keep it simple as we build the style. And instead of using a spline for the Y axis, I'm going to use a size instead, which can often be easier when you're starting out. Now I'm going to part picking the segments. So I'm going to start by taking a bottom kind of corner piece and put it at the start and bottom end of the spline. I'm going to set the pivots just like we saw before. So, okay, that's fine. But of course the building's like fallen over. It's laying down flat on the ground, but I can fix that by changing the X rotation property of the array just to turn it up the right way. And you'll always need to do this if you're not using a spline for the Y axis. Just to save time, I'm going to clone in all the other pieces of geometry in one go. This is a quick time saver, and you do it by right clicking on the node and just choosing clone multiple. And I'm just going to break them into the pieces uh, into little groups so we can see a little bit more clearly what we have. So I've got some facades that we can randomize. I've got some ground floor separately that we can randomize, and I've got top facades and top evenly segments too. I'm going to start with the um, bottom section. So I'm just going to take the bottom pieces and randomize them into the bottom input. And I'm going to change the default mode, just like we saw before, to adaptive. So there are no sliced pieces of geometry. Everything is scaled ever so subtly so that it fits in. Now, I haven't got any even these space segments between those, so I'll pop those in. Um, actually, I'm going to do the start. Sorry, the top, first of all. I'll do that in a minute. So I'm going to do the start and the end of the top, first of all. And they're going to fill in the top too. Now, I've got no randomization at the top, it's just one segment going across. You can see now though that if I change the Y size, the height of the building, the top piece moves up, the ground piece stays where it is. So what we need to do now is to fill in in between. Uh, so we can go for the start and the end, which will fill in the left and the right hand side, just like so. And we can create a sequence into the default input and create a pattern of these pieces, you can see a pattern on the x-axis there of geometry just by wiring it through a sequence operator. So you can see again how you can use, you can experiment with these modifiers. Just change the height a bit so that the clipping at the top is a little bit better. Okay, so what I haven't done yet is added any evenly segments, any pilasters through the middle. So I'm gonna do that now. So I'm gonna wire that to the X evenly input and just like before the spacing is far too close so let's change the distance to sort of five meters so now we can see the pilasters going up but there's a problem that the top floor and the bottom floor aren't the same height as the central floors and there's not a kind of evenly bottom evenly top option but what you can do is use this macro called segment y roll to kind of break out extra inputs from the X evenly input so what I can do is just wire this through here via the default into the default input. And now I've got extra inputs, top, bottom, evenly in marker. So I can basically wire different inputs to target those different sections. So I can put an evenly section at the top, which is different from the middle. And I can put an evenly section at the bottom, which is different from the top and the middle. It's a very handy little macro that, and if you're not familiar with it, um, it's well worth checking out for building your 2D arrays in a much simpler way. There we go. Now we can pick a footprint for a building and it's all looking fine. I haven't got any corners though, so we'll just take the same input and put it into the corner. And now I have. Great. The nice thing about this, of course, is that it doesn't have to be a rectilinear building. You can easily pick a curvy building like so to create some more interesting shapes and RailClone will just deform the geometry to follow that um, automatically for you without you needing to do anything else, which is where it starts to get very powerful. Another thing you can do, and I mentioned this, is that you don't have to use a measurement for the y-axis, you can use a spline. 
So here I'm just picking another spline and wiring it in to define the y-axis. It will go crazy, and that's because I, if you recall, I rotated the array by 90 degrees. So if I just set that back to zero, then that looks fine. You might wonder why you would do that, um, but it does give you some interesting possibilities because the spline, unlike a measurement, doesn't have to be straight. So you can curve the spline ever so slightly and to create more interesting shape buildings or whatever it is you're trying to create. Like so. Good. So far, so good. So this is um, a little trawl through an introduction, a very quick introduction to um, rail clones, presets, modifying the presets, linear arrays and two dimensional arrays. Uh, what I want to do now is just dip quickly while we're looking at this 2D array into uh, a couple of features of rail clone five using this same 2D building, uh, 2D array building as an example. So one thing we can do is limit by material ID list. So we haven't mentioned it, but you can restrict uh, a whole generator to the material ID on a spline. In the past, you could only do that by listing a single uh, material ID, but now you can use comma separated lists and you can use ranges. So here I can say, hey, only build a building on the, material, the splines of material ID four and five, four to five, sorry, and then one and three, um, which just makes it a lot more flexible. You can also use marker data and clipping splines. So marker data is a bit more an advanced feature, but it basically lets you apply markers to splines and use those parameters to drive particular parts of your graph. So here what I've got is imagining a basic massing kind of uh, setup where I've got boxes filling each spline. And I want to use markers to set the height of those. So I'm plugging in a macro here called X spline variables, which lets me read the details from a marker that I apply to those splines. To apply the markers, you use this rail clone spline modifier, and we just add markers either to the or all the splines by clicking all there, and then I can set the height of all these boxes directly from the spline itself. Or you can choose particular splines by turning off all and choosing the spline by number. So you'll see if I sequence through the spline numbers here, I can pick different splines to set the height. You'll notice that the parameters there weren't particularly helpful. They didn't have a name and they didn't have the right units. So you can customize the spline modifier by changing the names and the unit type from within the rail clone object. And then that set of presets becomes available to any rail clone spline modifier in the scene. You just pick it from the data set drop down at the bottom here, and then you can change it from there. And what I'm doing now is basically going through, adding a marker to each one of these individual clipping splines and I'm setting uh, some height information on them. This wasn't possible in Rail Clone 4 um, to be able to use clipping splines with Rail Clone marker data in this way. The important thing is that only one marker can be read per clipping spline, and it will be the um, sort of first one it encounters, really. So that works for boxes, that's fine. What if we want buildings? So what I've got here is a nested um, generator, so a generator plugged into another generator, and that lets me do the same thing, but with proper full geometry. But the only catch is I've got Y spline, Y size information that I want to access here, but the clipping information is in the original generator. So how do I get to it? I can't use that macro. What I need to do is to note the name of that generator, open up the expression, and then in the on the left hand side you'll see all of the generators that are valid for extracting data from. So I can find the one that's called clipping. I can find the expression that I want. I'm going to call it X marker data, or it's called X marker data. So I type return because I want to return that value out of this node. Double click X marker data. There's no need to type it all in. Give it a number of the. Um, this is kind of an index of of the of the data sets that you have access to, and then just click OK. And what that's done now is taken that same marker data that I just saw. We just saw being used on the simple boxes, but now I'm applying it to a nested generator too. That was kind of an advanced uh, technique. So if you're new to RailClone, don't worry too much about that. But if you're familiar with RailClone, you might find that interesting. Here's another example of marker data being used for Windows. So once again, I've got a number of closed splines here being used to set up Windows. And I've got a whole lot of user data that uh, lets me configure the 
type of sash, which way they open, and the number of divisions in these windows. Um, and I can put a different marker on each one of these splines to give me a different, completely different window configuration for each spline based on one set of splines and one rail flown object. So it gives you an idea of how flexible this approach can be if you set your styles up in this way. Rail Clone 5 also has some new evenly modes, which I didn't mention earlier, but you've got adaptive to any odd or evenly. And what that basically means is that you can force um, what it sounds like really an odd number of evenly segments or an even number of evenly segments or just how, how they come. So you'll see any will go one, two, three, four, you know, odd will go one, three, five, and even will sort of do two, four, six. In your parameters, you've now got the option of having drop down lists, which makes styles much more user friendly. Um, to create them, you just use this existing arithmetic node and you've got this uh, selector option and you open this dialogue up here and you basically add your options down here, just giving them a name and an associated value. So I'm just basically names of bridges I'm entering down here with an associated index value. Now you can see on the right hand side over here, I can sw quickly switch between bridge types, not just using a number as we would have had to do in Rail Clone 4, but using actual semantics, you know, names that make some sort of sense because they're associated with a value that we can use anywhere in the graph. Ooh, so that was our Rail Clone 5, a little diversion into a different scene there. I'm going to bring it back now to um, our starting scene and talk a little bit about how to quickly create background buildings using a commercial library that comes or that's available for rail clone. Um, it's called the parametric library and currently we have two collections of background buildings one and two. They're kind of very advanced versions of what I just showed you in that they're 2D array buildings but with a lot more parameters uh, and they're great for quickly filling in the backgrounds where you know your hero building obviously you've had to model quite quite carefully but you just want to fill out fill out the rest of the scene. They work in the same way as any preset so you would create the rail clone object you just pop open the library browser and you'll have installed here your background buildings. There are I think, 13 in each collection plus a, a preset that we'll talk about in a minute. So you just pick one of these and then you just assign the spline and you should get an instant building. Like so. So it's very easy and quick and um, efficient way of doing things. It's obviously got a lot of different parameters. I'm not going to explore them all here, but I'm just going to set the random variation to zero so I can precisely control the number of stories. And then you can set this to whatever you want, just using this value. So we don't want it to dwarf our, our, our main building, so I'll set it something low, like sort of six stories. And it's very quick and easy. I'll add another one just to the other side of the building, uh, just to illustrate a couple of other features. So I'll just open this. I'll pick a different building and import it. And then we'll just assign that to a different spline, like so. So you can see the procedure for adding these buildings is very quick. This is more or less filmed in, in, in real time. Uh, it's just that fast. The nice thing is just like we saw with the preset that we built, you're not restricted to rectilinear shapes. You can create curved buildings, uh, interestingly step buildings and that kind of thing just by clicking on the spline. Another thing you can do is to pick a spline that has several subsplines in which case you'll create multiple buildings at once. And that's where this second parameter comes in, stories variation, because you can randomize the heights of them. So if you wanted to create a block of buildings or something, each with a little bit of randomization heights, you can do that. Also not shown here is the fact that you can also randomize the materials from hundreds of variations too. So as well as randomizing the heights, you can randomize the look of the buildings and get uh, quite a lot of variation in, in your scenes. I'm just going to turn off the randomization for now so I can set the height of this building from the camera view so that it looks right in relation to my foreground building. So I'll set the value much lower, like so. Great. So that's the parametric library individual buildings. There's also, you saw in each of those libraries, there's also an all-in-one preset, which um, is for creating much larger areas of, of buildings. Each of the two collections has one of these and it has all 13 buildings built into it in a kind of simplified and more optimized way. And basically you create a grid with it. You, you use it like pretty much anything else. So you would just load it in. Um, there is an X spline if you want to use it, if you want to create kind of a curved street, but generally speaking, you'll create a grid using the X size and the Y array size parameters 
just there. So you just set this up. So for example, I've got um, just one here at the moment. I want to set it up to this seven, uh, seven uh, buildings on the x-axis and then on the y-axis let's create a grid of seven as well now this is quite an advanced uh, style actually it does a lot of randomization a lot of variation and it's adding clutter to the roofs which is all randomized and so forth so it's it's not um lightning fast to build uh, but we'll see in a little bit how we can make that more efficient but what it does give you if you look at it is quite a lot of randomization uh, for one for one thing and you've also got the option of having lights on or off so i've got an inside lights option which you can turn on or off uh, which i generally leave on because they still look pretty good in the shadow side of of buildings um i find and uh and and they're they're a really great way of quickly populating really large areas but like i say they are a little bit slow to build so this is why in Rail Clone 5, we've introduced a new feature called Proxy Cache. And what Proxy Cache allows you to do is once the style's been calculated, is basically to bake down all those instances, in this case, into the scene. And that completely removes the calculation time. So you just click it from the display rollout, click embedded, and that will take a little moment to bake that down. But once you've done it, um, it will increase your load times and render times significantly. So here, for example, we have a 13 second load on a cache enabled scene versus, and it's going to keep going, um, a much longer loading time on the scene with the cache disabled. And it's still going, I think it goes over a minute here. So the reason for that, like I say, is that the the there is, there is no longer a calculation time. It's just, it's saved the rotation and the slicing and all the different pieces of the style, baked it into the scene. It's slightly increased, obviously, the size of the scene file um in order to do that but it's improved the time it takes to that would also be a time it takes to launch a render carrying on the rail clone 5 theme i'm going to cheat a little bit and add in the background of this scene a roller coaster at this point just so i can talk about banking controls so this is a feature of the rail clone spline modifier uh, you basically add the rail clone spline modifier the same one we use for markers and there's a new banking setting down here, a rollout. And it's very simple to use. You just click on the spline to add banking markers. And then those markers can be manipulated by rotating them using, a, using the rotation gizmo or using the angle settings uh, in the modify panel. Either way is fine. And there's you don't need to change anything in the style itself. It just automatically starts to deform to bend around that spline. Another neat feature is that you can add multiple Rail Clone Spline um, modifiers. So here I'm adding a second one to the top, um, and you can use those, you know, for different generators in your in your in your style, or you could use them to to have different options um, or whatever. Uh, so you basically do what I'm doing here: add two Rail Clone Spline operators, and then go into your Rail Clone style, and you can choose which one to use by going to the Rules tab and just choosing them from a number here. So it's banking modifier one, banking modifier two. That number counts from the top down on the, the modifier stack. You can also disable banking for certain generators. So you can see here, I've added the, the kind of supporting framework and that does not want to bank. So I can get rid of that by just changing the modifier value to zero, which basically turns off banking fixes that for you so it's a really um, powerful new feature with a lot of flexibility i'm really interested to see what sorts of objects people people can make with it okay so we're going to go back to our scene now and, and ditch the roller coaster for something more sensible which is vehicles and um, the reason i wanted to emphasize this is to point out that rail clones a great scene layout tool as well as a modeling tool so for just sort of laying out objects that don't need to be deformed, that don't need to be sliced, rail clones are a really great option. So here we have a few cars that we're going to use. These are proxies. Um, so they don't want to be sliced. Well, they won't be sliced, in fact. Um, and we're going to use that spline that I said was already around the outside of the pavements that's being used for the curbs, just to pop some, car, some, some uh, cars into this scene. So I will just... Um, so I see these from Chaos Cosmos, actually. So these cards from Chaos Cosmos, which if you've got V-Ray, you will have access to, and you can use these very happily in Rail Clone or Forest Pack. So I'll just open the style editor, and we'll create a style for distributing cards to show you how this is done, a little bit of a different approach. So we'll create a spline, just like before, and we'll pick the curb spline from the scene. I'm going to add the segments just to bring in 
the proxies. I am going to turn off bend and slice uh, here. You shouldn't actually need to because proxies won't be bend and, bent and sliced anyway if they're true proxies. Um, but it's just a good idea just to, you know, keep things neat and tidy. Once I've set those up, I'm going to copy and paste it to bring in the other cars to save me from setting the parameters multiple times. So there we go. I've got three cars here. You, of course, you could you could have more. Obviously, I want to randomize them. So I'll put them through a randomize modifier. And I'll wire these into the default input. And we're going to get some serious traffic. Okay. So that's obviously not right. We don't want uh, that much, uh, <laughs> that many cars. Um, we want to put a bit of spacing between them. So um, you could do this with padding, but the trouble with that is it will change the way they bend around the corners. So what I prefer to do is to use a sequence uh, operator and then wire into the second input a transform node. And then you can use that transform node as a kind of empty segment to add a gap between the cars. Now, the cars have disappeared because the transform node has no size. And if you were to leave it there, it would try and distribute infinite zero size transform mode. So you'd, you'd end up with a, a kind of infinite loop. So it's just kind of security thing. As soon as we give it a size, you can see it works. OK, so that's nice and easy. We can just give it a size. Of course, that's a fixed size, which isn't really how cars tend to be organized. So what we'll do instead is to export that fixed size parameter. And this is any attribute, any parameter in rail clone can be exported so that you can wire it to numeric inputs or do other things with it. And I'm going to wire it to a random number generator and just change the random number um, range from maybe one meter to five meters or maybe 10 meters to half a meter. So it doesn't look like much is happening. And that's because at the moment we're generating uh, on start. So it's generate on start just here, which means it's generating one value at the beginning of, of, of the time when it builds the array. So what you'd want to do is to change it to gen, uh, segment. So it generates a new value every time it's used. Great. Um, and you can then also play with various things like the order in the sequence, which will make a difference and the way it goes around corners and various other bits and bobs and play with the values. And you'll get some interesting quick um, car layouts. The other thing is that I'm because the spline is around the edge of the pavement. Obviously, the cars are up on the road or up on the pavement, which is not what we want. So I'm going to use the Y offset parameter of the generator, the brain of the rail clone member, just to offset the cars ever so slightly so that they're in the road. Now, if we look at the road, it's got a camber on it, uh, which means the wheels aren't both touching the ground. And although I can change the Z offset, I can only do that until one wheel hits the ground. So I really want to project this down onto that surface. And that's something that not many people realize RailClone can do. But you can just wire a surface node into the generator surface input and pick a surface from the screen. And it projects the, the, the spline down onto that surface automatically and parametrically for you. If you want to align the, seg uh, the segment on the y-axis to match the surface, as you would with a car to make both wheels match, you just go into the segment settings and choose align y with surface. And there we go. Now we've got cars. That are projected automatically onto the surface and who and which follow the camber. Now I didn't want cars in the foreground like you can see here sort of blocking my view of the building so this is um, where you can use kind of exclude areas like you would in forest pack with rail clone. Um, so here I'm drawing a spline around this central area in the foreground and I want to use that to remove cars from that area. So I'm just going to add that spline to the rail clone graph. I'm going to wire it to an input called clipping area. And remember, we turned off slice, so none of these cars will actually be sliced. They'll just be removed. But by default, it's keeping the cars inside the spline, and we want them outside the spline. So we change the mode to exclude, from include to exclude. And then that will remove all the cars that are outside the spline instead of keeping the ones that are inside. And that gives us a much better result. You've also got the option to choose how you tackle cars that have no slice turned on. Um, you can either preserve them, remove them, or you can actually cut the geometry. But with proxies, it won't it won't cut the geometry, what, no matter what you do. Great, great, great. So um, once you have done that, we're going to dip a little bit into Forest Pack, because Forest Pack has a mode which is not dissimilar to Rail Clone, uh, in that it can distribute easily along splines. 
So what we're going to do is use that to add the trees to that same spline that's being used for the curbs with Forest Pack. So same thing, I'm going to create a Forest Pack object in icon mode. So I'm not picking a surface or anything like that. I'm just going to pick a tree from the European Common Trees pack from the 3D Garden. And I'm going to change the distribution mode to path. So I can say this is like rail clone light. I can pick that path from the scene and I can just change the spacing. Now, Forest Pack won't ever deform and it won't slice, but if you quickly want to lay things out like this at regular intervals um, and you want to use forest color and so forth, then you can use Forest Pack instead. So just randomizing those trees a little bit. There's only one tree, so we don't want to see the repetition and we can disguise that as much as possible by randomizing it. So that's very quick and easy to do, as I hope you agree. Um, while we're on the subject of Forest Pack, I wanted to touch upon a new library that we'll be releasing soon, which is for leaves. So we've done the trees and we want to add some fallen leaves below those trees just to add a little bit of um, kind of more interest to this scene. So there's a new leaf library coming, which has got a lot of different presets in it in several categories. We've got curbs, we've got individual leaves, we've got patches of leaves for big areas, and we've got little piles for when you know someone's tidied up a little bit. In this particular instance, I'm going to use individual leaves and use fall off to create them around the curbs. So I'm going to go into generate mode this time, and I'm going to pick the closed spline from the scene, and you can see it fills the whole area, which isn't what I want, I want it only around that spline. So you can do that by going into the areas rollout and choosing force open splines. So any closed spline can be made to uh, behave like an open spline by clicking that checkbox and then you just set a thickness. I want to set a fall off and I'll just leave this curve at its defaults and set the include area. And what that does is it means you'll get far fewer leaves the further you are away from that spline so you'll get a natural kind of fall off and of course there are different things you can do with that to make it more interesting and now i want to project those leaves onto these two surfaces so i'll just add those to the surface rollout and that gives me some fallen leaves there's a very basic way of doing it of course you could add more interesting like say unique fall off curves adding patches and clear areas and so forth but um just for adding leaves very quickly to a scene like this that works really really well Moving on to another Rail Clone 5 thing. One of the big things we introduced for Rail Clone 5 is the ability to distribute groups and lights. This is something we ask for a lot once we introduced the feature to Forest Pack. I'm happy to say it's now possible. So this little example it just illustrates both of those in one. So I've got lamp post here, which is made of some geometry, and I've got three lights to actually light, illuminate the scene. Clearly they're separate at the moment. So what I'll do is I'll group those together just by clicking on group and giving it a name. Uh, Give it a few zeros so I can find it in a second and go OK. I've got a rail clone object already set up this time. So I'll open the style editor and <laughs> behind my head, there's a segment. So what you can't do is pick a group directly from the scene, same as Forest Pack. You need to hit H on the keyboard and then you can pick the group from the item picker. And that's it. I mean, the groups and lights are loaded into rail clone in pretty much exactly the same way as you would load geometry. I'd like to be able to make a longer video about that, but um, actually it's really quite straightforward. You just pick it and it works. Um, one thing I didn't show there though, was the fact that you can use, now in V-Ray 2, you can use rail clone color to randomize the tint of those lights as well. So that's quite cool if you want to add some interesting effects to do with light color. And that brings me to the end of this particular little presentation. I think I've got, yeah, I've got 10 minutes to spare in case there are any questions. Um, I, I'm aware that I went through a lot of that very quickly, um, but hopefully it was, if you're new to Railclone, it wasn't too overwhelming. Um, we've got plenty of beginners tutorials on our website, which will help you get up to speed quickly. Uh, I'd recommend having a look at those, but please let me know if you've got any questions. Yeah, thank you, Paul. That was amazing. Uh, did not disappoint whatsoever. Um, so yeah, as Paul said, this is the time. This is your chance to get your questions in. And what a treat to have your answer, you know, coming directly from Paul. Um, anyway, so we, we don't have any question, but we'll, we'll wait a few seconds. And in the meantime, um, I want to remind everybody that I've been recording this session 
and um, I want to thank everybody. I'm going to take the screen back for a second uh, while I wait for questions and uh, show everybody um, where they can get Railcon 5 or Forest Pack if they so choose. And uh, remind everybody that Novage is changing the way designers purchase 3D software. Um, how so? You can get anything you want in Novag, so all the choices, the freedom to mix and match, and um, we also have people that can talk to you over the phone um, to and help you navigate the complicated configuration and uh, services as quick as it gets. Um, so I still see no questions, so I want to thank everybody for attending and um, remind you to visit novage.com and uh, you can watch again this webinar uh, on our YouTube channel. Just search for Novage. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank have you. a great rest of the night. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.